Part 7 of 13 from set number 2005, Introducing C.G. Jung's Red Book, a BC Recordings copyrighted presentation by Stefan Heller entitled Jung's Red Book, Book 2, Chapters 18 through 21. It's a truly magic book. In any event, we better proceed with our material now. And where we are at the present time is the chapter entitled The Three Prophecies, which is toward the latter part of Book 2 of the Red Book. And since the uh, material in the chapter, as well as the title relate to prophecies, it may be useful very, very briefly to clarify in our minds a little bit as to what prophecy means because both prophecy and prophet are frequently misunderstood terms. So we need to keep in mind that a prophet is not primarily someone who foretells the future, which is a kind of vernacular misunderstanding. Prophecy as understood by the great prophetic religions, such as Judaism, Islam, and Zoroastrianism, a prophet is a human being who becomes a mouthpiece of the deity. At least that way it works in the monotheistic context. And we need to keep in mind that such mouthpieces historically have frequently included in their message glimpses of the future as well, in addition to various other disclosures that they made. And uh, the intention of those references to the future was usually the intention of making people change their ways in order to uh, avert dire developments in the future. That is how prophecy came to be associated with foretelling the future. So prophecy can mean an utterance inspired from a supernatural source and a glimpse into a, a possible future as well. So we will now read the beginning of our chapter on the three prophecies. You may recall that the previous chapter ended with a great sort of excitement on the part of the author. He felt that amazing and strange things were uh, coming his way, or to quote, miracles and terrible mysteries are close at hand. I feel the things that were and that will be behind the ordinary, the, the eternal abyss yawns. The earth gives me back what it hid. That is how chapter 17 concludes. And then chapter 18 begins, Wondrous things came nearer. I called my soul and asked her to dive down into the floods whose distant roaring I could hear. This happened on the 22nd January of the year 1914. Now, to my knowledge, at least thus far in the book, the chapters that I have covered, this is the only time in the actual text of the Red Book itself where he mentions a date. We need to keep in mind, however, that the original notes of his visions, which are in the so-called Black Books, and I think about four or five of them are part of the exhibit, so we'll get a chance to see them too. They are smaller, more unpretentious notebooks. In the black books, he always dated when he wrote a particular passage, when a particular visionary experience came to him. But these dates were not transcribed as such into the red book itself, except here. And I think that that in itself has um, considerable meaning, and you will see probably to some degree why. So he says, this happened on 22nd January of the year 1914, and he even says, as recorded in my black book. And thus she plunged, namely his soul, into the darkness like a shot, and from the depths she called out, will you accept what I bring? And this is of considerable significance because the phrase occurs again and again. And of course, behind it, let's say, is, a, I think, a very important circumstance that often occurs in connection with visions, with altered state experiences, prophetic or otherwise. 
the experience is coming, but as important as the the coming of the visionary experience and disclosure is the willingness or the lack of willingness of the person to accept it. If you don't accept it, it goes away. If you don't accept it, it becomes distorted. It is repressed, things of that sort. So we always have here the the soul that acts kind of like the as the psychopomp uh, as, a, as kind of a Virgil to Dante, in this case, to Jung, always keeps asking him, will you accept it? And of course he, he does. And so he answers, I will accept what you give. I do not have the right to judge or to reject. And the soul says, so listen. And now comes, uh, these are awesome descriptions of particular visions which pertain to the three prophecies, and I will explain afterwards, I'll just read it now. So listen, there is old armor and the rusty gear of our fathers down here. Murderous leather trappings hanging from them, worm-eaten lance shafts, twisted spearheads, broken arrows, rotten shields, skulls, the bones of man and horse, old cannons, catapults, crumbling firebrands, smashed assault gear, stone spearheads, stone clubs, sharp bones, chipped arrowhead teeth, everything the battles of yore have littered the earth with. Will you accept all this? It obviously all pertains to warfare, warfare. And Jung answers, I accept it, you know better, my soul. The soul says, now comes the next one, I find painted stones, carved bones with magical signs, talismanic sayings on hanks of leather and small plates of lead, dirty pouches filled with teeth, oh my dear, uh, human hair and fingernails, timbers lashed together, black orbs, moldy animal skins, all the superstitions hatched by dark prehistory, will you accept all this? And he answers, I accept it all, how should I dismiss anything? Just to give you a little preview, what this all pertains to is magic, magic, both primitive and otherwise. So the first vision was of warfare, the second vision is of magic. And now the soul says, but I find worse, fratricide, cowardly mortal blows, torture, child sacrifice, the annihilation of whole peoples, arson, betrayal, war, rebellion, will you also accept this? He answers, also this, if it must be, how can I judge? This is attached to warfare, but apparently in a little more direct, in a little more personal manner. And the soul goes on, I find epidemics, natural catastrophes, sunken ships, raised cities, frightful feral savagery, famines, human meanness and fear, whole mountains of fear. And uh, Jung answers, so shall it be since you give it. And now comes the last one. The soul says, I find the treasures of all past cultures, magnificent images of gods, spacious temples, paintings, papyrus rolls, sheets of parchment with the characters of bygone languages, books full of lost wisdom, hymns and chants of ancient priests, stories told down the ages through thousands of generations. And Jung replies, that is an entire world whose extent I cannot grasp. How can I accept it? And the soul says, but you wanted to accept everything. You do not know your limits. Can you not limit yourself? And he says, I must limit myself. Who could ever grasp such wealth? And the soul says, be content and cultivate your garden with modesty. And he says, I will. 
I see that it is not worth conquering a large piece of the immeasurable, but a smaller one instead. A well-tended garden is better than an ill-tended large garden. Both gardens are equally small when faced with the immeasurable, but unequally cared for. Take, and the soul says, take shears and prune your trees. Now we need to look at this in an interpretive sense. First of all, Jung once again dialogues with his soul. The date is significant, as I mentioned, January 22, 1914, because this is five months before the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which occurred on June 28, 1914, and which was the beginning of World War I. And thus the prediction of the war, which runs through this chapter really, which is implicit also in the first prophecy, is definitely uncanny. We need to remember from the autobiographical material on Jung and the biographies that Jung had very powerful and very frightening presentiments of the war at that time. In memory streams and reflections of C.G. Jung, he sees a, a, a tremendous flood of blood and fire. And at the end of the previous chapter, the 17th chapter, he wrote, and I quote again, Unrest has moved in, a quiet underground earthquake, a distant great roaring. Ways have been opened to the, and this is important, ways have been opened to the primordial and to the future. Now the primordial, of course, being very ancient, being what is past already, and then the future. Miracles and terrible mysteries are close at hand. I feel the things that were and that will be. So once again, past and future. Behind the ordinary, as I read that before, uh, the eternal abyss yawns. So all this is related, at least to some degree, to his apprehension in 1914 of the coming great catastrophe. After all, we need to keep in mind that with all the uh, upheavals and all the wars that Europe has seen over the centuries, certainly World War I by that time was the greatest, for which reason it was always called as the Great War that appellation has somewhat vanished when the next war, which was even greater, came to pass. But it certainly was the greatest. There was, there was greater destruction and, and certainly greater carnage in World War I than even in the Napoleonic Wars, which were perhaps the bloodiest up to that point that had been seen. So the great emphasis seems to be placed on the question asked by his soul, will you accept what I bring? And to accept prophetic vision, therefore, as I noted before, is always a question. As he states in his commentary, after the dialogue, as you know, each one of the chapters really always starts with some action, which often contains a dialogue with someone, either with his soul or with somebody else, and then afterwards are his interpretations, his reflections, the further developments that ensue from that. And as he says afterwards in his commentary in this chapter, there were three prophecies, war, magic, and religion. The last one that I read about uh, the buried temples and so forth, pertaining to religion. The first of these refers obviously to the war or actually perhaps to the two world wars which were only about 20 years apart and which were certainly causally connected with each other. One, one grew out of the other. Uh, many of the statements have direct relevance to the events I think of the terrible 20th century which was really the seculum horribilis, if there ever was one. After having symbolically described both war and magic, then the soul refers to 
horrors that are not directly connected perhaps to either war, but most likely to the horrors of oppressive regimes such as Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, Communist China, Cambodia and others. And we repeat, the soul says, fratricide, cowardly mortal blows, torture, child sacrifice, the annihilation of whole peoples, arson, betrayal, rebellion. Certainly this can be applied to concentration camps, holocaust, killing fields. The horror of these strikes fear into Jung's heart, as it well might. I was shaking a little bit when I was reading this myself. I think my neighbors must think that I I generate earthquakes nowadays. (laughs) (coughs) By accepting these visions, he accepts the horrendous psychological effects that they have upon him and even on the reader. The third is the issue of religion, obviously a religious development in the future that has some organic connection to the distant past. And these include, to call to memory once again, paintings, papyrus rolls, sheets of parchment with characters of bygone languages, books full of lost wisdom. The the thoughts suggest themselves of Dead Sea Scrolls, Gnostic codices in Coptic writing, assuredly bygone languages. These appear as the heralds of the new religion in the distant future. What appears fairly clear is that Jung is shown a vast amount of coming history and he is overwhelmed as we might be. He asks in agony, how can I accept it, meaning the prophecy? His soul finally tells him that he can't do anything objective about all this and therefore he has to do what he can for himself, within himself, in order to uh, survive psychologically. And here he takes a phrase that he quotes a little bit freely from Voltaire. Voltaire wrote in Candide, at a certain point when somebody makes an announcement, all that is well said, but we must cultivate our garden. This, of course, being a metaphor that no matter what great ideas and and terrible uh, visions and insights into the future we may have, there are things to be done now. Cultivate your garden, attend to your situation. It is mentioned in the uh, footnotes, incidentally, that Jung kept a bust of Voltaire in his study. So with all of his, let's say, dislike of the rationalism of his time, he was not opposed to Voltaire. And of course, Voltaire appears to us so much like the, the, really the founder of rationalism but if one studies his life and his writings one finds that there, there was quite an other side to Voltaire as well so the soul says to him take care of your smaller business possibly whatever you are doing your psychology, your uh, patience your own work on a smaller scale Now we uh, may take a look at his commentary following the dialogue. Here he writes, From the flooding darkness the son of the earth had brought, my soul gave me ancient things that pointed to the future. She gave me three things, the misery of war, the darkness of magic, and the gift of religion. If you are clever, you will understand that these three things belong together. These three mean the unleashing of chaos and its power, just as they also mean the binding of chaos. War is um, obvious and everybody sees it. Yes, unfortunately, you see it and you feel it as well. Uh, Magic is dark and no one sees it. Religion is still to come, but it will become evident. Mm. So he's not talking about uh, religion as it exists now, or as it existed uh, at the time when he wrote this. Did you think that the horrors of such atrocious warfare would come over us? 
Did you think that magic existed? Did you think about a new religion? I sat up for long nights and looked ahead at what was to come and I shuddered. Do you believe me? I am not too concerned. What should I believe? What should I disbelieve? I saw and I shuddered. But my spirit could not grasp the monstrous and could not conceive the extent of what was to come. The force of my longing languished and powerless sank the harvesting hands. I felt the burden of the most terrible work of the times ahead. I saw where and how, but no word can grasp it, no will can conquer it. I could not do otherwise. I let it sink again into the depths, namely the vision. I cannot give it to you, and I can speak only of the way of what is to come. Little good will come to you from outside. What will come to you lies within yourself. Now he draws it again to the central point, which is really, which he reiterates always over and over again. But what lies there, namely, within ourselves? I would like to avert my eyes, close my ears, and deny all my senses. I would like to be someone among you who knows nothing and who never saw anything. It is too much and too unexpected. But I saw it, and my memory will not leave me alone. Yet I curtail my longing, which would like to stretch out into the future, and I return to my small garden that presently blooms, and whose extent I can measure. It shall be well tended. Obviously, the, the garden is a metaphor. I seriously doubted that much was blooming in January in, in, in the mountains of Switzerland, except maybe indoors. <laughs> you know. So here again the question arises, what was shown him? What, what specifics? What time period? Dr. Shamdasani happily provides us with a revealing sentence from Jung's draft, which is the draft is uh, sort of the intermediate material between the black books and the red books. So, the, you know, the sequence was first he wrote everything down in the black book. Then from that he wrote a draft for the red book. And then he wrote it in the beautiful calligraphy with the illustrations and all that into the red book. So this was in the draft, which, of course, Shandasan we consulted quite heavily. And in the draft, this is what Jung wrote. This is himself writing. How can I fathom what will happen during the next 800 years, up to the time when the one with a capital O begins to rule? I am speaking only of what is to come. That's in the, in the draft. So I think it is fairly clear that in 800 years' time, he expects a great being, the one, is to come to rule, and that in the period until then there would have to be endured terrible wars and their aftermath, a growth of magic, and ultimately the coming of religion, at least in part based on documents in characters of bygone languages. And of course, to me, always Coptic characters dance in my head when I, I see that. Incidentally, 800 years from the time of this vision would be A.D. 2714. You got to remember that, you know, a lot of time elapsed between the time that Jung wrote this and our own time. So we have around 700 years to go until, as he said, the one begins to rule. Uh, so, you know, I leave it up to you how you want to spend that 700 years. <laughs> um, there is also a, a good statement of Jung worth quoting that appears in the black book number four, quoted by Shandasani. Therefore, I walk on like a man who is tense and who expects something new that he has never suspected before. I listen to the depths warned, instructed, and undaunted, outwardly striving to lead a full human life. 
This is what he writes in response to these developments. But we first we need to look at his great and complex encounter with magic, which is the next chapter, chapter 19, that is entitled The Gift of Magic. Now, it may appear strange to you, or at least to many of you, that he should include so powerfully the subject of magic in these three prophecies and in the commentaries upon them. And you wonder why would that be? What what does that have to do with anything? Well, you will see that it certainly has a good deal to do with the interior psychological situation of uh, people, but you also have to keep in mind that when he wrote this, and indeed throughout his life, especially the early part of his life, there was a considerable, uh, well, how should we put it, a sort of undercurrent of intellectual and spiritual interest in Europe and in the world in magic. Beginning with the um, writings of Eliphas Levi, who died in the year that Jung was born, in 1875, let's say the whole field of the borderline interests of what some people call the occult and the psychic and so forth was subsumed under the name magic because that is how Eliphas Levy wrote about it. You also have to remember that these very words were written at a time when an other curious character who was born in the same year as Jung, uh-huh. namely Edward Alistair Crowley, was carrying on in various places in Europe. And you know, you may think that these are sort of tangential issues of the culture, but to the depth psychologists, that's not what they were. You have to keep in mind, as Dr. Shandasani says in his introduction, and I think I mentioned it a little bit too in the first lecture, that all of the early psychologists, going way back before Freud and Jung to Janet and Theodore Fleurnois, all these people were tremendously interested in the, let's say, in the borderline studies, in spiritualism, in visions, in altered states, in crystal gazing, you name it. And then, of course, also, I think it would be uh, lacking in historical accuracy not to mention it, with the, uh, certainly with the early part of the 20th century also in psychedelics. Because mescaline was available by this time, not in a synthesized form right away, but as extracted from peyote and in the University of Heidelberg, in, in among the psychiatrists in Vienna and elsewhere, everybody was, at least to some degree, experimenting with these things and conversant with these things, which for lack of a better word, would have been called magical. So you have to keep that in mind. And this, of course, was also the great kind of counterweight to the uh, extreme materialistic rationalism of the time. It's a little bit as, of course, in an earlier period in the 18th century, Goethe uh, wrote at one time when, at the time when there was some uh, haunting going on in the, in a little town somewhere around there, where, not far from where he lived in a town called Stegel. And Goethe wrote, the Teufelspack hält sich an keine Regel. Wir sind so klug. Und dennoch spukt in Tegel. It was in Tegel. And they say, the, the bunch of devils will not observe any rules. We are so wise, and still it haunts in Tegel. <coughs> so the same thing was true. Here was rationalism and materialism on the one hand. On the other hand, there were weird and magical things going on. And these folk psychologists uh, were certainly aware of that and really so must we be so he then after the recognition of the great upheavals and catastrophes which certainly have uh, you know, momentous uh, social and psychological 
consequences, as we have noted after the two wars, he goes on to the, uh, the strange and perilous subject of magic, which is actually gives the title to the next two chapters, the first one being the gift of magic, which is chapter 19. In the uh, chapter 18 on the, prof- the three prophecies, ends with the following paragraph. I don't think I quoted this. And horror crept over me. Am I not tightly bound? Is the world there not unlimited? And I became aware of my weakness. What would poverty, nakedness, and unpreparedness be without consciousness of weakness and without horror of powerlessness? Thus I stood and was terrified. And then my soul whispered to me, and at this point, the next chapter, the chapter entitled The Gift of Magic commences. And again we have a dialogue between Jung and his soul. A peculiar noise is heard, and Jung is told by his soul that an important gift is coming to him. The gift appears, and it is a black rod, as it is described, formed of a serpent with two pearls for eyes and a gold bangle around its neck. It is a magic rod or wand. Uh, Now I have seen some magicians once, but never one quite like that. Jung's soul tells him that magic is often a misfortune for those who possess it. Yet when he asks, what shall I do with magic? His soul's answer is, Magic will do a lot for you. Don't try to do something with it. It will do a lot for you. He is told that magic always demands a sacrifice. The sacrificial theme, of course, having occurred earlier. Replying to uh, Jung's anxious question, whether this sacrifice might be love, he is afraid repeatedly in the course of uh, his experiences that he might be asked to give up something that is really precious to him, such as his love of others and their love of him, of his family, of his friends, of humanity in general, because these were very uh, very precious things to him, as indeed they might rightly be such for all of us. And so he is told that it is not love that he has to sacrifice. But he is, he is told that it is solace. Now, I wouldn't be terribly anxious to give that up either. <clears throat> but let's say all of this rightly disturbs and confuses Jung. And his soul tells him, you don't know magic, so don't judge. Also, he is told not to act so enlightened. And this is, of course, a term that we came across before, because enlightenment in this, let's say, in the uh, European intellectual context doesn't mean the enlightenment of Buddha, but it's of the age of enlightenment, which is a phrase for uh, intellectuality, for rationalism, and sort of the, the entire sort of rationalistic and ultimately materialistic heritage of the era of enlightenment. You see, no, don't, don't be so enlightened. And that it is high time that he overcame his scientific prejudice, he's told by his soul. So much agonizing discourse then gives way to a sort of acceptance speech wherein with some reluctance he accepts the dark magical rod or wand with its serpent, and this is what happens at that time. All this, he says to his soul, all this leaves me so dazed and confused. Won't you give me an enlightening word? Here is enlightenment again. And the soul says, oh, so it's solace you long for. Do you want a rod or don't you? In other words, don't, don't expect all kinds of gratuitous help from me if you want this magical gift. And then he goes into quite a monologue. You tear my heart to pieces, he says to his soul. 
I want to submit to life, but how difficult this is. I want a black rod because it is the first thing the darkness grants me. I don't know what this rod means, nor what it gives. I only feel what it takes. I want to kneel down and receive this messenger of darkness. I have received the black rod and now I hold it, the enigmatic one, in my hand. It is cold and heavy like iron. In fact, in certain magician rods, there is usually a piece of metal, which is a lodestone, a magnet, that is embedded at the end of the the rod that would make it certainly heavy and metallic. It is cold and heavy like iron. The pearl eyes of the serpent look at me blindly and dazzlingly. What do you want, mysterious gift? All the darkness of all former worlds crowds together in you, you hard black piece of steel. Are you time and fate, the essence of nature, hard and eternally inconsolable, yet the sum of all mysterious creative force? Primordial magic words seem to emanate from you, mysterious effects weave around you, and what powerful arts slumber in you. You pierce me with unbearable tension. What grimaces will you make? What terrible mystery will you create? Will you bring bad weather, storms, cold, thunder and lightning, or will you make the fields fruitful and bless the bodies of pregnant women? What is the mark of your being? Or don't you need that, you son of the dark womb? Do you content yourself with the hazy darkness whose concretion and crystal you are? Where in my soul do I shelter you? In my heart? Should my heart be your shrine, your holy of holies? So choose your place, I have accepted you. What crushing tension you bring with you, isn't the bow of my nerves breaking? I've taken in the messenger of the night." highly dramatic monologue and the soul says the most powerful magic lives in it and then he goes on to say I feel it and yet can't put into words the nightmarish power granted to it I wanted to laugh because so much alters in laughter and resolves itself only there that's something for us to remember you know If we lose the power to laugh, then we are really, really in trouble. As long as you have that, uh, there are ways of dealing with the various forms of reality that come to us. A very, very important thing. And so he says, I wanted to laugh, but laughter dies in me. The magic of this rod is so solid as iron and as cold as death. Forgive me, my soul, I don't want to be impatient, but it seems to me that something has got to happen to break through this unbearable tension that came with the rod. And the soul says, wait, keep your eyes and ears open. So Jung then goes on as follows. Great is the power of the way. In it heaven and hell grow together, and in it the power of the below and the power of the above unite. Now this is of course a constantly recurring theme, and one can draw I think the conclusion from it that uh, Jung was very much convinced that real progress of the soul, real progress of individuation at the individual or at the collective level, always has to draw from both polarities, from both opposites. And his contention was definitely present with all his respect that he had particularly for the figure of Jesus Christ and for many things in the Christian tradition that where the Christian tradition had sort of gone wrong was that it excluded more and more the dark the unknown, the hidden, the unlived, the shadow side of life. 
and it was striving for uh, order and clarity and goodness in a conscious way. So that eventually, largely, initially at least, under the influence of the Christian religion, a kind of very, very widespread one-sidedness of consciousness arose. But the striving was always for what at any given time would appear as the light and the other things being left in the dark. And this he considered to have been really a a very uh, unfortunate and a very catastrophic development in the culture. And he felt that this needed to be remedied. And kind of the main, I think the main rationale behind it being that if we really want to progress, if we want to really go forward in an individuational sense, we need all the Material, we need all the force, we need all the energy that we can muster. And if we leave a large part of ourselves, a large part of our unconscious aside or behind, then we simply don't have that available to us. So we must be able to draw on all of this. And particularly in this case, the drawing forth of material from the dark, from the mystery, from the... Um, the unknown and the unexplained and the uh, unlived he calls magic. As indeed in many ways it is, because it is not a rational process, but quite the contrary. So this is quite important. So magic, he says, is the working of men on men. This, this is a quotation actually. I better start from the beginning. He says, great is, these are his words, great is the power of the way. In it heaven and hell grow together and in it the power of the below and the power of the above unite. The nature of the way is magical as are supplication and invocation malediction and deed are magical if they occur on the great way magic is the working of men on men but your magic action does not affect your neighbor it affects you first and only if you withstand it does an invisible effect pass from you to your neighbor so ultimately we are again dealing with a a situation with a process that is, first of all, primarily intra-psychic, and only secondarily does it affect others and other situations. There is more of it in the air than I ever thought, he writes. However, it cannot be grasped. That's a great help, no doubt. There follows a lengthy poetic tale of a solitary old magician who is cooking up a healing potion for people who urge him on and whom he urges to patience. This uh, portion and the chapter conclude with a stanza which seems to indicate a, a sort of triumphant individuational denouement of the magical process. So it's, where does the magical process lead? And here is the stanza. Day approaches and above the clouds a distant sun. No solitary cooks healing portions any longer. The four winds blow and laugh at their bounty. And uh, he mocks the four winds. He has seen the stars and touched the earth. Therefore his hand clasps something luminous and his shadow has grown to heaven. So the ultimate objective, the ultimate conclusion of magic being that the magician has overcome the forces of nature, both external and internal, and has thus triumphed. You know, that, with that we go on to chapter 20, which is entitled The Way of the Cross. But it is let's say it contains material that you would not maybe ordinarily include under that name. And this is how it starts. I saw the black serpent as it wound itself upward around the wood of the cross. 
it crept into the body of the crucified and emerged again transformed from his mouth. It had become white. It wound itself around the head of the dead one like a diadem and the light gleamed above his head and the sun rose shining in the east. I stood and watched and was confused and a great weight burdened my soul. But the white bird that sat on my shoulder spoke to me, Let it rain, let the wind blow, let the waters flow and the fire burn. Let each thing have its development. Let becoming have its day. So the chapter begins with this rather Gnostic symbolic scene involving in this case not only the the cross and the serpent but in addition the crucified Savior on the cross. The symbolic scene indicates that once again the principle of sacrifice. In this case the sacrifice of self. Mm-hmm. in a serious manner in the first explanatory paragraph following the opening symbolic scene Jung pays eloquent tribute to the sacrificial example of Christ he indicates as he says the crucified to whom it was no small thing to live his own life and who therefore is raised to magnificence In the draft quoted by Dr. Shandasani, Jung identifies the black serpent as the serpent of my way. What we have here is the willingness of the individual psyche to begin to live its life of individuation. This involves a giving up of inauthentic personalistic ways of being which people prefer to becoming their real selves in this regard the sacrifice of the crucified one is the grand example for us in terms of sacrificing our inauthentic self because Jung says that Christ not only preached about the true self but lived it and that is what we must do ourselves This is why this this truly astonishing image which we just read described where the serpent enters the form of the crucified one and emerges transformed. Like all things have a tendency to develop, so must we develop by becoming our deific potential. So what we really have here in the uh, in this curious, strange and off-putting scene of what the serpent does, we really have the mystery of the imitatio Christi, of the imitation of Christ. And of course, you may remember that he refers extensively to Thomas Akempis in one of the, the earlier chapters. So by, by entering the form of the one who sacrificed himself, who sacrifices himself on the cross, the serpent itself is transformed. From a black serpent, it becomes a white serpent. It has a halo around its head. The sun rises. The serpent becomes luminous. And then Jung muses for quite a while on uh, what subsequently later on he called the way of individuation. Upon sacrifice of the old personal self, follows a hard life of intuitive movement forward, of a self-renewing guidance, a life of painful authenticity against many difficulties. And I, uh, I dare suspect that an awful lot of us here, probably all of us, know what he is talking about. It is a lot more painful, a lot more difficult, even to try to be yourself than to be all kinds of other things that people would like you to be and people expect you to be. As long as you try to live up to anyone's expectations, whether it's individual people or society, 
your authenticity is not there. But when you are really beginning to become yourself, then a great deal of pain, a great deal of disapproval, a great deal of suffering ensues. There's really no doubt about that. So this is the way of the cross, as he says. Jung also notes the relationship of this process to magic when he writes, the ancients devised magic to compel fate. They needed it to determine our fate. We need to determine inner fate and to find the way that we are unable to conceive. Because you know, real authenticity is something that we are unable to conceive. Because if somebody asks us, what are you really like? Unless you are a liar, you're going to say, I don't know. You know, I don't know what I'm really like. Maybe I, I would run away if I, I knew. But, you know, you don't know who you are really like. So how can you live up to something that you don't know? Therefore, it's an unknown, a magical process. You have intentionality, you muster the energies, you go toward it, and then that inner self, that greater self, which subsequently was called by Jung, the self with the capital S, then begins to live through you. And it's a magical life in the sense that true and authentic and real things begin to happen, but they don't happen because of your rational choice. They don't happen because of your decision. They don't happen because of anything that you brought forth from your intellect, but they happen because you are drawing them forth from a great mystery within yourself, which, for lack of a better word, Jung came to call the unconscious. Actually, Freud before him called it the unconscious already, which... I still think and I reiterate from time to time is really an unfortunate term. I wish that uh, something else could be devised in lieu of it because it's not really idiomatically, it's not really a good translation of the German das Unbewusste. When we think of unconscious, we think of somebody who... um, is just staggered out of the neighborhood bar and is, you know, and is, is falling down, who has lost consciousness. But this is a different, uh, you know, very, very different thing. So it is thus that Jung now repairs to an other locality to meet with someone whom he describes as a magician. And he is a I quote him, For a long time I considered what type of magic this would be. Whoever cannot find it within himself should become an apprentice. And so I took myself off to a far country where a great magician lived, of whose reputation I had heard. And thus we come to the final chapter of Book 2, which is continued and fulfilled by what should have been book three, the so-called scrutinies. And this, of course, is the, uh, the story of Philemon. The chapter is entitled The Magician. It is book two, chapter 21. Now, what we need to keep in mind here is that we know, of course, from various statements in uh, biographical and autobiographical works of, of Jung, that Philemon became an extremely important, a tremendously inspiring and guiding figure for Jung, of very, very great importance. But here in the uh, first encounter with Philemon, he appears in a sort of somewhat primitive form, which, however, as you will see, as soon as Jung leaves Philemon and the, uh, the interaction is over with Jung begins to recognize as to what a, a disguised figure he was really dealing with and what, you know, what a momentous being this Philemon really is. Now, we need to say just a couple of words about the name Philemon and where at least ostensibly, this figure comes from into Jung's view. 
Philemon is an ancient Greek name. There was uh, there were several people called Philemon in in history. There was a, a Greek poet in the third century. There was also an associate of Saint Paul, whom he refers to, whose name was Philemon. But most importantly, there is a fictitious story, well, you know, mythological story, recorded by the Roman poet Ovid, you know, Publius Ovidius Naso, <coughs> great poet, in his Metamorphoses of a couple called Philemon and Baucis. At least in Greek, it's a it's a kappa. So, in, in Latin it may be Bautzis, who lived, according to the story, in Phrygia. Now, they play hosts to Zeus and Hermes, who, disguised as they are as two nondescript travelers, are refused hospitality by, the, by all the neighbors. And so they come to the household of these two simple people, and they let them in. As a reward, the god saved Philemon and his wife Baucis from a great flood that destroys the rest of the country. It's, it's the way the description is. It's, it's very similar to the great flood myths, others such as that of Noah. Their house is turned into a temple, and the elderly couple are made a priest and priestess. Now, this is all in the original mythological story as recorded by Ovid. After they die... They are saved from Hades, which, you know, neither the Greeks nor the Romans had much liking for, for probably rather good reasons, by being turned into trees. Now, some of the present tree huggers, I think, would be happy about that. You hug a tree, you might be hugging Philemon. (laughs) There you are. Uh, So, uh, Goethe makes a couple named Philemon and Baucis appear in his Faust where they may or may not be Ovid's original legendary couple. Jung was inspired both the classical tale and by Goethe. The name is derived, interestingly, from Philema, meaning a kiss. And thus Philemon means the loving one who kisses. I could go into all kinds of kissy business here uh, on the, uh, you know, the really the, uh, the mystical and initiatory statements that are made in various scriptures about the uh, kiss, including St. Paul telling the disciples to greet each other with a kiss, but I'll bypass that right now. So Jung obviously sees Philemon first in the light of the ancient legend and of magic. Later, he is increasingly revealed as time goes on as a deific instructor, indeed uh, an avataric figure. So the figure of Philemon appears in this chapter at first as a, as a disguised figure, a, an old magician with whom Jung argues some. In uh, subsequent parts of the work, especially in scrutinies, He appears more and more as the illumined and indeed deific wise old man. So uh, we need to take a look at the beginning of the chapter entitled The Magician. After a long search, I found a small house in the country fronted by a large bed of tulips. This is where Philemon, the magician, lives with his wife, Baucis. Philemon is one of those magicians who has not yet managed to banish old age, but who lives it with dignity, and his wife can only do the same. Their interests seem to have become childlike. They water the bed of tulips and tell each other about the flowers that have newly appeared and their days fade into a pale, wavering charoscuro, lit up by the past, only slightly frightened of the darkness of what is to come. So there is kind of this romantic picture of the two old people, but as far as Philemon is concerned, that is really a disguise. There follows a long paragraph describing Philemon as exceedingly old, and possibly with his powers decreased, that it so it appears to him when he comes to Philemon. In retrospect, knowing of Jung's description of him in later passages, we can see that this must be a disguise in order to make the somewhat timid Jung feel more comfortable. 
It is interesting to note, however, that beginning in this initial chapter, Jung consistently spells Philemon's name in Greek capital letters, never in any other way, which is, of course, you know, a very honorific way of treating this figure. Jung now walks up to Philemon and begins a conversation with him, which in many ways sounds like a sort of bantering and fencing with ideas. Philemon keeps alluding to the fact that if Jung really wants to learn magic, he must curtail or even abandon his logic and his sequential reasoning. The conversation indicates that Philemon is leading Jung on toward profound recognitions in a sly and discerning way. Here also we need to keep in mind that, you know, traditionally, going clear back to shamanistic times and so forth, the, the magician is always a bit of a trickster. You know? Probably none was a greater trickster in that respect than George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, who was, we might say, a modern magician, and he used to refer to magical or occult phenomena in the following manner, that there are tricks, semi-tricks, and a few genuine magical phenomena. And so he was, he, he was never opposed to the tricks. So you can see that there is a, a kind of a wise trickiness about Philemon too. He, the way he talks to Jung, he's, he's leading Jung to some recognitions that he otherwise would not come to. Philemon's answers are brief and often end in questions. You ask him a question, he asks you a question. Yeah. The main point seems to be that in spite of his argumentation, Jung is really a promising disciple, that Philemon recognizes him as such. Thus Jung says, Whenever I want to learn and understand something, I leave my so-called reason at home and give whatever it is that I am trying to understand the benefit of the doubt. I have learned this gradually because nowadays the world of science is full of scary examples of the opposite, where, uh, where they don't give the situation a doubt. And we might say, by judging by what we see around us, that computer technology has not improved the situation. In any event, Philemon replies, in which case you could do very well for yourself. Philemon even indicates that old men make better magicians because in them the power of reason declines due to old age. <laughs> I don't know if that is a great compliment for uh, people with this kind of hair. It becomes fairly evident that the issue is not one of age, even though Philemon declares at one point that due to his magic he is very old but at the same time without the deterioration of consciousness. The entire conversation seems to be characterized by a certain light-hearted humor on the part of Philemon and the usual earnestness on the part of Jung. Now Philemon ends by saying, you are beginning to understand magic, so I must assume that you have good aptitude for it. And Jung then begins to interpret the encounter. And as he interprets, he is then it begins to dawn on him that what he was dealing with was a disguised person. And that he, he was really in the presence of incredible greatness and incredible power and wisdom. Here is one of his conclusions appended to the insight that rational men of their times don't use magic. But it is a quote, but it is another thing for whoever has opened the chaos in himself. That somebody who is in the process of individuation, who is in the process of becoming himself. We need magic to be able to receive or invoke the messenger and the communication of the incomprehensible. One must value the incomprehensible and unreasonable equally, 
although they are not necessarily equal in themselves. Thus the unreasonable, the incomprehensible needs <coughs> magical practices to open it up. And Jung then discourses on Philemon, and I think these will be very uh, revealing uh, passages. All right, where are we? But what mystery are you intimating to me with your name, O Philemon? Truly you are the lover who once took in the gods as they wandered the earth when everyone else refused them lodging. You are the one who unsuspectingly gave hospitality to the gods. They thanked you by transforming your house into a golden temple while the flood swallowed everyone else. You remained alive when chaos erupted. You it was who served in the sanctuary when the peoples called out in vain to the gods. Truly it is the lover who survives. Why did we not see that? And just when did the gods manifest? Precisely when Baucis, that's the wife of Philemon, wished to serve the esteemed guests her only goose, that blessed stupidity, the animal fled to the gods who then revealed themselves to their poor hosts who had given their last. Thus I saw that the lover survives and that he is the one who unwittingly grants hospitality to the gods. So somewhat like the story of Buddha at the time of his death, you know, who, um, there it's a little bit reversed, but still, Buddha is the, the guest of a poor man who offers him his last, whatever it was, his last pig or something of that sort as a meal. And even though the old Buddha knows that this will be deleterious to him, he eats it and then he dies. So that it was more, was more important to to value the hospitality of the poor, innocent, good man, than to say, can you imagine Buddha saying to the man, I'm a vegetarian? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you see. It shows you that, the, uh, the, let's say, we are dealing with a different value system. And here, uh, Baukis had this, this, uh, uh, had this last goose, you know, and she offered the goose to the gods. They didn't really eat it, but the hospitality and the kindliness and the love were the, were the matter that really mattered. And Jung keeps asking these questions about Philemon when Philemon is no longer there. And he, On the which mask of Philemon are you hiding? You did not strike me when I saw you as a lover. But my eyes were opened and I saw that you are a lover of your soul who anxiously and jealously guards its treasure. There are those who love men and those who love the souls of men and those who love their own souls and therefore love others. Such a one is Philemon, the host of the gods. You lie in the sun, O Philemon, like a serpent that coils around itself. Your wisdom is the wisdom of serpents, cold with a grain of poison yet healing in small doses. Your magic paralyzes and therefore makes strong people who tear themselves away from themselves. But do they love you? Are they thankful, lover of your own soul? Or do they curse you for your magical serpent poison? They keep their distance, shaking their heads and whispering together. Are you still a man, Philemon, or is one not a man until one is a lover of one's own soul and of all souls? You are hospitable, Philemon. You took the dirty wanderers unsuspectingly into your hut. Your house then became a golden temple, and did I really leave your table unsatisfied? What did you give me? Did you invite me for a meal? You shimmered, multicolored, and inextricable. Nowhere did you give yourself to me as prey. You escaped my grasp. I found you nowhere. Are you still a man? Your kind is far more divine and serpent-like. So he, he goes on speaking in this manner of Philemon. Why are you laughing, O Philemon? I cannot fathom you. 
but do I not see the blue air of your garden? What happy shades surround you? Does the sun hatch blue midday specters around you? Now this one is very important. Are you laughing, O Philemon? Alas, I understand you. Humanity has completely faded for you, but its shadow has arisen for you. How much greater and happier the shadow of humanity is than it is itself. The blue midday shadow of the dead. Alas, there is your humanity. O Philemon, you are a teacher and friend of the dead. They stand sighing in the shade of your house. They live under the branches of your trees. They drink the dew of your tears. They warm themselves at the goodness of your heart. They hunger after the words of your wisdom, which sounds full to them, full of the sounds of life. I saw you, O Philemon, at the noonday hour, when the sun stood highest, you stood speaking with a blue shade. Blood stuck to its forehead, and solemn torment darkened it. I can guess, O Philemon, who your midday guest was. In a later uh, scene, as indicated by Dr. Shamdasani, it was Jesus who visited Philemon in his garden, and Jung only later recognizes that that is what it must have been. This was the one with the blood on his head from the crown of thorns. How blind was fool that I am, that is you, O Philemon, but who am I? I go my way shaking my head, and people's looks follow me, and I remain silent, O despairing silence. Clearly, Jung has now penetrated below the disguise. He is beginning to see that far from being a, a, a semi-senile old magician in the garden, Philemon is an awesome being, a master of wisdom and of love, a deific teacher and a hierophant. His visit has done its work. He now begins to, to see what awesome presence he has now encountered. He is human, yet more than human. Uh, he is a stupendous mystery, and of course he returns. Here are some further samples. Well, let's see. Uh, which? Are you lonely, O Philemon? I see no entourage and no companions around you. Baucis is only your other half. You live with flowers, trees, and birds, but not with men. Should you not live with men? Are you still a man? Do you want nothing from men? Do you not see how they stand together and concoct rumors and childish fairy tales about you? Do you not want to go to them and say that you are a man and the mortal as they are, and that you want to love them? O oh, Philemon, you laugh. I understand you. Just now I ran into your garden and wanted to tear out of you what I had to understand from within myself. O oh, Philemon, I understand. Immediately I made you into a savior who lets himself be consumed and bound with gifts. That's what men are like, you think. They stink like Christians. But they want even more, they want you as you are, otherwise you would not be Philemon to them, and they would be inconsolable. If they could find no bearer for their legends, hence they would also laugh if you approached them and said you were as mortal as they are and want to love them. If you did that, you would not be Philemon. They want you, Philemon, but not another mortal who suffers from the same ills as they do. So Jung concludes his meditations on Philemon by saying, O master of the garden, I see your dark tree from afar in the shimmering sun. My street leads to the valley where men live. I am a wandering beggar and I remain silent. And recognizing finally and completely that he had met the master in disguise, he says, O master of the garden, your magical grove shone to me from afar. 
I venerate your deceptive mantle, you father of all will-o'-the-wisps. So this is the, the aphorism immediately preceding the well-known painting of Philemon, obviously painted after 1914, where the Greek legend reads, Father of the Prophets, Beloved Philemon. So then, the sum total of the message of the Red Book, of the entire book at least so far, and would be, I think, appropriate to mention that at this time is, that the God within needs to be recognized and effectively discovered. There is something within us that is of the infinite, of eternity, of the fullness, of the boundless. But unless we recognize it, unless we do something, like Jung did, when you remember the whole story with the egg and so forth, it remains torment. And this discovery has to be made in us. And from there it will irradiate the external world and history. History is our story. As we are able to accomplish the great work, as we encounter the, uh, the great and, and deific figures of such a wise old man as Philemon and others as as helpers, as we become their apprentices, which is what Jung set out to do when he went to see Philemon, then the process begins. And by way of our own authentic self-discovery, by way of resurrecting the sleeping Godhead within ourselves, we contribute to the deification, uh, the apotheosis of others in the world. The prophecies mentioned, I think, are worth remembering. And they certainly exist within ourselves, even as Jung saw them existing outside as well. War. The war is the internal conflict that exists within ourselves just as soon as we enter the way of individuation. I mentioned, I think, on another occasion, the, the quotation from the early part of the Gospel of Thomas, when he who seeks has found he will be troubled. This is the conflict, this is the war within us. If we don't want that, if we can't take that, if we think that is so much, then we can continue to go our way in a rather sleepwalking manner, as probably Gurdjieff would have put it. The second is the magic. This is the entry into contact with the collective unconscious, as we might call it psychologically. And as that contact occurs, life becomes magical. I can testify to that. So can anyone who has, let's say, touched, touched the hem of the garment of the eternal. Life becomes strange, life becomes magical. It contains synchronicity, it contains strange developments. And if I may say so without, I don't know, putting you on, one thing that you can do is have this book on your table mm -hmm. and things will start <laughs> happening in your, in your house. They certainly have in mind. And I expect they will continue to do so. It's, it, it's, it becomes a sacred object that is sort of the, the paradigm of your own individuation and therefore it draws magic onto itself. But Philemon would say, why are you using logic? Why are you using action? Trying to explain the magical. Don't explain it, but look at it and participate in it. So this is a definite let's say, a definite stage in the development, and it's a very, very powerful one, a very important one. Much could be said about it. And ultimately, there is, uh, you might say, the higher magic, which is the magic of religion. And there is a definite indication here and in subsequent portions that the new religion of the gnosis of the inner God is coming. And this is what he has alluded to. And as I said, after all, we only have about 700 years to go. Uh, but we shall do what we can within ourselves, for ourselves and for each other in that direction right now. And if we uh, do so, then I believe that people 
like Carl Jung and perhaps even mysterious beings like Philemon from somewhere in the, in the magic realm uh, behind the dragons and behind the twisting serpents and the rising suns and the beautiful gardens and the golden temples will smile at us and somehow the message will come to us well done well done well done I thank you very much copyright MMBIF DC recording catalog number 200507 for more information about available lecture titles and for many other resources visit gnosis.org that's g-n-o-s-i-s dot o-r-g